Hi everybody! Welcome back to Echo. We are still on the final day of Leo's route, and we're continuing with part two of that. Let's jump right into it. We pull quietly out of the driveway in Carl's car, which makes almost no sound since it's a hybrid. Leo's driving, of course. Carl's still woozy, and Leo actually had to help him walk around to find the keys. I sit in the back, between Carl and TJ, while Kudzu sits in the passenger seat next to Leo. I'd overheard Leo mumbling to Kudzu to sit next to him while I helped Carl into the car. Something about them needing to be able to get out of the car quickly with their guns if things went down. Leo doesn't floor it like I expected him to, but we move down the bench of the mountain and through the town speedily enough. I see TJ look out his own window intently, and I can only imagine this to see if he can spot Jenna, maybe even Flynn. Dude, I don't feel good. Carl mumbles next to me, both hands on his stomach, twisting at the fabric of his hoodie. Uh, just puke on the floor if you have to. I don't think Leo's gonna stop. Carl leans over and puts his head between his knees, groaning. That gets TJ's attention, and he starts rubbing the ram's back slowly. Good thing he feels like there's nothing in me. So what the hell is going on? Where's Jenna? TJ frowns. We don't know. What happened then? I take a deep breath, trying to figure out how to explain. Well, we're not sure what's going on everywhere, but on Saturday while I was at the diner with Leo, I go through my story as quickly as I can, exp explaining to Carl what's been going on. The rest of the car is quiet, so I get anxious when I get to the part about Brian and skip over it as much as I can. I only mention that he held me there for a day. By the time I finish, we're already passing the lake. Huh. So it's... Is this Sunday already? Sunday morning? Yeah, I guess so. So I was out a whole fucking day? I don't say anything in response. What happened to you, Teej? Are you okay? Carl turns his gaze on TJ, who just nods. Yeah, I was seeing things too. People chasing me. I'm okay now, though. TJ actually does seem pretty stable now after everything that's happened. Maybe taking care of Carl is taking his mind off whatever happened to him. Either way, he doesn't expand on what he saw. Carl shivers and puts his head back down while TJ continues to rub his back. A few minutes of silence go by before Carl speaks up again. That feels kind of nice. Reminds me of my mom. Yeah, actually my mom did it too. I thought I might help. Hey, I love you just so you know. All of you guys. I'm glad I'm not in that place anymore. I love you too, Carl. And everyone else. You too, raccoon man. Uh, thanks. Yeah. I affirm my own love for everyone. Kudzu glances back at us before turning his attention out his own window. Leo doesn't say anything from the front, his focus solely on the road ahead of him. I watch the desert whip by us, for the first time feeling somewhat safe as the town disappears behind us. But, of course, it doesn't last long. What's that? On the side of the road there. Hmm? Leo turns his head in the direction that Kudzu points. We all do. But we see changes everything for me from that point on. Sure, things were crazy. And I had a hard time believing anything that was happening. But it was explainable. People like Duke, Brian, TJ, even Carl were all seeing things. But it was kind of a distant thing, in a way. Something everyone else was experiencing. Something I was exempt from. But now, there it is. Something I can't explain right in front of me. What is that? Oh my gosh. TJ covers his mouth. Carl sits up straight, trying to see. Leo slows down as we pass. There's my car, all the windows shattered. And there's Duke, lying a dozen feet away from the open door of the driver's side. And there, crouching over him, is something I can't explain. Hairless, body and limbs long. Way too long. The head comes up and all I see are three holes and blood. T 
TJ screams next to me and Leo shouts something before stepping on the gas, slamming me back into my seat. I try to look back, but whatever it was is gone. At least, it's gone from where it was, because I see something move next to my window when I turn to face it, and it stares back at me, but only for a moment. That thing, whatever the fuck it is, disappears almost the instant I register that it's there. I'm only staring out into the, into the blackness of the desert. Still, three holes, two eyes, and a mouth blink back at me in a sort of afterimage before that too vanishes. What was that? What was that? TJ's grabbing my arm, claws digging painfully into my skin. I'm too shocked to even pull away as TJ leans forward next to me, staring out my window. At least I know I'm not the only one that saw it. TJ squeaks again when no one answers him. What was it? I don't know. Some... some kind of animal, maybe? I've never seen anything like that before. Could have... had a disease? Lost all of its fur or something. Maybe Duke hit it. But it was walking! TJ's arm is looped around mine and I can feel his body shaking. I look over my shoulder, through the back window. At this point, my car is a good distance away, only visible because the headlights are on, a streak of light fading out across the desert. Duke, is he? <laughs> Some dry retching noises followed by heavy splattering sounds cuts me off. Carl is hunched over in the seat, head between his legs. It isn't hard to figure out what just happened, especially when the smell hits me. Oh my gosh, Carl! TJ looks torn between blanching away and comforting the ram. Carl comes back up, looking like he's about to say something before diving forward again. A much louder retch, followed by a much quieter plopping sound follows. I grimace, feeling my own stomach roil. God. Kudzu's looking back at us, a paw up to his nose. You okay? Carl keeps his head down a while longer, his fingers twisting into the fabric of his shorts. TJ tentatively rubs his back. I... I would have done it out the window. I don't want to open any of the windows now, though. It's okay. Leo, are there any napkins up there? Leo, who's been silent up until now, remains silent. He's staring out the windshield hard, paws on the wheel in a death grip. After a moment of silence, Kudzu checks the cup holders, then drops open the glove compartment. After rummaging around for a minute, he pulls out a stack of fast food style napkins. He hands them back to Carl, who starts mopping up whatever mess he's made on himself. During all this, I'm still glancing out the windows. Not head on though, because I'm terrified I'm going to look straight into those eyes again. We drive in silence for the next five minutes with no creature in sight, thankfully. But I don't know what to think right now. There's no way what I saw was some animal like Kudzu implied. The way it moved, the way it was crouched, most of all its face. I've never seen anything like it, at least anything that's not a Halloween costume. Maybe... maybe one of the locals dressed up in a costume or something? But then how the fuck did he keep up with the car? Were we going that fast? You did slow down a little. I keep these thoughts to myself. Everyone looks freaked out enough without any more speculation. So instead I lean back in my seat, deciding to just close my eyes. We're on our way out, and soon I'll be safe in a police station or a hospital or something. It'll be explained when the cops get here. I try not to think about Duke on the ground, Janice in the diner, Jenna out there, somewhere, with that thing. I shake my head, eyes still closed. Are you okay, Chase? TJ's arm is still around mine, the places where our fur is pressed together getting hot and sweaty. I don't mind, though, as long as it brings him some comfort. Yeah, I'm just tired. Actually, now that I mention it, I am pretty tired. I didn't exactly get much sleep in Kudzu's trailer. Or Brian's. I start to drift off as my head bumps gently against the headrest. The soft whir of the AC on my forehead. What the fuck? The car lurches as Leo slows us down again. 
Reluctantly, I opened my eyes, half expecting to see some other kind of nightmarish ghoul out the window. But I don't see anything. Just the road stretching ahead of us. What's wrong? Lee was quiet for a moment. I can't see his face since I'm right behind him, but I can see the outline of his twitching ears. I, I don't... Leo turns in his seat, looking out the passenger window, then his own. I'm heading the right way, right? I look out the window as well, not seeing anything except sagebrush and cacti. But then I do notice something. The mountains, which have been on the right, are now on my left, rising up ominously in the distance. Had we turned around somehow? Unless we're on the highway, which we definitely aren't. This road merges right onto the highway. There's no way we could miss it. I hear TJ gasp softly next to me. I look over at him, but he's looking straight ahead, out the windshield. I do the same, and in the distance I can see headlights off the side of the road. No way. What is it? Leo brings the car to a hard stop, throwing me forward into the seatbelt. Then he does a quick three-point turn, shoving me right, then left, before he smacks back into the seat as Leo accelerates again. Whoa, careful. My parents will kill me if you fuck up their ride. Carl laughs nervously, but no one pays attention to him. There's no fucking way. I was going straight. Um, there's that side road that takes you to some of the trails. Maybe we sort of... went off on... Leo snaps at the link suddenly. There is no way, TJ. That road is fucking gravel. I would have noticed. Leo is hunched in his seat like an angry dad, staring out the windshield. His car is pra- whoops, his ears practically dancing on his head. I can feel TJ trembling, so I lean into him a bit, letting him know that I'm there. It's clear that Leo doesn't want any talking, so we're all quiet. This time I keep my eyes open, staring out the window in case Leo did get sidetracked somehow. I focus on the mountains, making sure that they don't disappear. They slope up and down gently under the moonlight, speckled with the dark spots of rock and vegetation. Vaguely, I remember back when I'd been obsessed with skateboarding, and I'd always imagined myself skating those slopes on car trips to Peyton. Up and down. Up and down. If only Echo had anything like that. The only slope we had was the one down from Carl's mansion, and it was way too big. I tried to skateboard down at once, but that had ended in disaster when... I blink, staring out the window as the mountains just... disappear. Slope down to nothing. I squint, then I look out Carl's window. Sure enough, mountains. Leo... I know! Leo speeds up instead of turning around, though. This is im-fucking-possible! What are you doing? TJ's claws come out against my skin again as he gets that scared cat look in his eyes. Leo mumbles, mostly to himself. There's no way we're going back to Echo. Leo, slow down a little. Leo lets out a small growl but relents, and TJ's grip on my arm loosens some. I'm gonna keep going until I see that car, because I sure as hell didn't turn around that time. The tone in Leo's voice keeps any of us from arguing. Though I hate to admit it, something about his demeanor has me just as scared of him as I am of whatever is out there. Another minute of driving, more awkward silence, then Leo hisses through his teeth. Straight ahead of us, the headlights appear. What? I must be dreaming. It's like we're stuck in some kind of loop. Leo slows down more and more until we come to a gentle stop. We sit there in silence, staring at my car about a hundred yards in front of us. Leo starts muttering darkly to himself, looking out the windows, looking at the dashboard. I want to ask him if he's okay, but I know what the answer is. TJ makes soft whimpering sounds next to me, like he's trying not to cry, and I finally put my arm around him. It's okay, it's just... dark, and we're going off-road somehow. I whisper whatever comes to my mind to explain what the fuck is happening. Carl has his head down in his paws, completely quiet. He could be asleep for all I know. I think about suggesting that maybe we should just wait it out until morning in the car. 
but as I open my mouth, I hear a scratching noise toward the back of the car. TJ's ears perk up, which lets me know that I'm not the only one. Instinctively, I turn around in my seat. Bits of glass flying to my face, and the next thing I know, I'm cowering in the seat, head down as far as I can push it. Carl, very much awake now, screams at Leo. Go, go, go! Leo's already on it, and I can feel the car jolt forward. Then I'm bouncing up and down at the seat as we go off-road. Leo not bothering with a three-point turn this time, instead going for a full U-turn. We're back on the asphalt and speeding down the road when I feel it's safe enough to raise my head back up and look out the back window. For a moment, I'm terrified that I'm going to find that thing crouched on the trunk, staring in at us. But instead, all I see is a giant hole through the back window, the remaining glass jagged. Are you guys okay? Leo looks back and forth between us and the road ahead of him. I sit up fully. I think so! I yell at him over the sound of the car and the wind whistling around behind me. Carl has bent over in his seat, too, brushing glass from his hat and hoodie. I look at TJ, who's still crouched over in his own seat, cowering his head. Covering his head. Bits of glass are scattered on his back and in his head fur. I pick some of the pieces out from the fur on his neck and lean over him. TJ, are you okay? TJ shudders and doesn't say anything as I pluck some of the shards from under his collar. What was that? Kudzu shouts back at us, staring through the window. I don't know! I don't want to think about what I actually think it was. Leo keeps up the high speed, hitting some of the potholes hard enough that I'm worried we're going to get a flat. Then we'd be in some real trouble. We drive on for another five minutes in silence. Then the headlights of my car appear in front of us again. This time no one says anything and Leo doesn't bother turning around. I watch out my window as we fly past my old car. Duke is still there on the ground. No movement from where he was the last time we saw him. Since this is the area where the creature seems to be prowling, I look out the back window. I want to be ready in case it tries to come through it again. But nothing happens. All I see is a small stretch of asphalt illuminated red from the tail lights, and all I hear is the wind whipping through my ears. I keep a hand on TJ's back as he continues to remain hunched over. Carl sits quietly, staring out his window. On the bright side, the bashed-in back window has diminished the smell of sick. Sparse dots of light show up on the horizon, indicating where Echo is. That's when Leo speaks up. Alright, what we're gonna do is head back to my house. You guys can get some sleep while I figure out what to do next. Leo pauses, but no one says anything. Sound good? Yeah, not much left to do. Leo grunts and hunches forward in his seat again. There's a sinking feeling in my stomach at the thought of going back to Echo. There is the comfort of at least not being out in the wilderness, but I wonder if that's much worse than the town, even with that creature prowling around. I stare out my window, watching the mountains move slowly by under the moonlight as we turn onto Lake Emma Road. I'm wondering if taking one of the mountain roads out of town would be worth it, whether we'd have enough gas when it happens. A crouched figure sits on the peak of a hill, just about 50 feet from where we are. I squint at it, just barely able to make out what looks like shoulders and a head hunched up under the light of the moon. Uh... I'm directly across from the thing when I open my mouth. But I'm barely able to make a sound when it moves. It dashes down the hill in the blink of an eye, covering the distance between it and our car in a matter of two seconds. One moment I'm staring at a tiny black figure in the next that's right up against the car, smashing into the side between Leo's door and mine. My head smacks into the glass and I see a flash of white. At the same time I hear Kudzu shout at us to hold on. TJ screams, Carl yells. My feet are fucking freezing. I open my eyes and stare down at them. It's almost too dark to see, but I can hear the sounds of sloshing water and screaming. Chase! Chase! Wuh! My head aches, and there's something in my eyes that stings. Everything's blurry. Chase! Are you okay? A big paw prods at my chest and I look up. I can barely make out the outline of ears. Leo? Wait. And it hits me like the car crash we were just in. That thing! I look out my window again, 
but it's all shattered and spiderwebbed. But I can see what, what looks like water pouring through it. At the same time, I feel that icy cold sensation running down my back as the water comes through the broken back window like a waterfall. We crash into the fucking lake. Chase! I'm awake! I'm good! I grab at my seatbelt, taking way longer than it should to get it undone. All the while, there's a bizarre, feral yowling sound next to me, and I don't realize it's TJ until his claws find my chest and arm and dig in. Ow! TJ, stop! Calm down! But he doesn't even respond, continuing on with that god-awful sound. Through the window! Carl's already up on the rear deck, trying to push through the water coming in. Come on! Carl's screaming, panicked voice disappears suddenly, and I can only hope that it's because he got out. Chase? Chase, come on, we need to get you out! I feel Leo's big paws grabbing at me, but I turn and push them away. I'm fine! Let me help TJ! Chase! Leo, I'm a fucking otter! The water at this point is up to my chest. The car's front end is tipped down on the water, and with the sparse moonlight coming in through the back, I can see it's up to Leo's neck. Kudzu is somehow in the back with me and TJ, where Carl was. He's staring at me, eyes wide, looking torn between escaping and helping me. Go, Kudzu! Through the window! Leo, go out through your door! Chase! Go! I scream at basically everyone, and I can only hope they do as I say as I duck down and the water goes over my head. The quiet peace of underwater is a sharp contrast to the fucking chaos my brain is in. Somehow, in the wreck, the back seat crunched forward, and TJ's seatbelt buckle button is lost somewhere in the crease. I grit my teeth. I can hold my breath almost ten minutes, but I know for most other species it's less than two. Far less if you're panicking out of your mind like TJ is. I grit my teeth as I calmly try to reach between the fold between the seat and the back, despite the desperate clawing the lynx is giving me. Again though, it's far too wedged in to get a hold on. Soon my calm demeanor melts away as I fumble uselessly with the seatbelt, and time stubbornly marches on. I feel myself start to panic as I just grab TJ around the body and yank as hard as I can. But it's no use at all, and when I pull on the chest strap it's jammed and I can't get any slack. TJ's grasping and clawing starts to become weaker. I try to think of something to use to cut the strap, but there's nothing. Maybe a shard of glass? I move up and away from TJ, toward the back window, trying to ignore how weakly he tries to clutch at me. As I reach up to the seat, though, my hand slips between the headrest and rear deck. I reach in further and realize it's the trunk of the car. With a lunge, I reach down and feel along the bottom of the seat back. My paw runs up against something hard and metal, and I know I found what I'm looking for. I grab up the buckle and unlatch it. Swimming around as quickly as I can, I grab the strap across TJ's chest and set my feet against the seat. I pull back as hard as I can and, just like that, it comes undone. I scoop TJ up, his limp body giving me an extra burst of adrenaline as I set my feet against the back of the driver's seat and push out. My aim is a little off as my head hits the ceiling instead, but I'm able to find the hole pretty quickly and kick through it. It's a little awkward to undulate my body into a nice clean swim with TJ's weight, but I manage it well enough and within seconds we break the surface. I breathe out into the air while TJ coughs and sputters. His arms wrap around my neck tightly and I have to put a paw under his arms to keep him from strangling me. TJ! We're good, you're good! Calm down! I look around and I'm amazed to see how far we are from the shore. It's a good hundred yards away. I can already see Kudzu standing there and Leo's in the shallows, shouting to Carl who's a few feet further in, splashing around. I kick off in that direction as, Le as TJ continues to hyperventilate into my ear. TJ, it's okay. Remember when you used to ride on my back in the lake? It's like that. Like old times? I try to adopt a soothing tone between my ragged gasps for air. TJ does finally settle on my back, though his arms are still around my neck. Still a lot better than him dragging me down with him. His gasps calm down as we get closer to the shore tapering off into a weird sort of mumbling sound. They can make out a few words, though, and one of them is a name. Sydney. I frown and swim a bit faster, wanting to get him back to dry land so that he can get his wits back together. Meanwhile, Carl finally grabs onto Leo's outstretched paws, and the wolf pulls him back to shore. All the while, he stares at me and TJ intently. He... didn't... didn't deserve... 
I shush him gently as I finally feel my toes find the sandy bottom of the lake. I gently pull the links back with me to the narrow strip of land between the lake and the incline that slopes up to the road. Carl's already there, flat on his back, spread eagle. So I do the same with TJ, laying him down right next to the ram. He's still trying to talk, though. Chase, did Sydney? How long did he... Did he... Gently, I put a paw over the lynx's muzzle. It's alright, man. Try to relax. Breathe. Kudzu stands next to me and starts to reach out to touch my shoulder. You okay? And then a much larger paw comes out from behind me, pushing Kudzu's arm aside as I'm pulled back into a tight hug. Leo huffs into my ear. Oh, thank God, thank God. You were under for so long. I'm okay. I reach back with a paw, setting it against the side of Leo's face. When I bring it back, I see that it's a bit darker than it should be. I look back and immediately see the gash on the side of Leo's face. Shit, your head! Leo brushes off my paws. Your head! I think we both hit our windows when... something hit us. I reach up, feeling around my forehead before I feel a sore, sticky spot on my fur. It isn't a bad cut, but it's definitely leaking a good amount of blood. It was that thing that we saw next to Duke. I saw it standing on a hill and it just ran at us. I look over at Kudzu, who's moved to stand over Carl, his arms hugging his chest tightly. Kudzu, are you okay? I'm, f I'm fine. His response is tense and a little high-pitched. I don't know about Carl, though. He had a little trouble swimming back. Carl lets out a choked cough in response. I gently pull away from Leo and kneel down next to the ram, between him and TJ. He's conscious, luckily, though his panting is a bit shallow. I set a paw gently on his head. You okay? Uh, yeah? He says it like he's asking me a question. You sure? I mean, yeah, I'm breathing. I didn't mean to leave you guys, but it's fine. Staying with us would have made things way worse. It's strange to me how collected I am right now. I guess it's that same numbing feeling that i felt since escaping Brian's trailer. Just take the fucked up stuff in and roll with it. I'm not bad at swimming, but it was so fucking cold. My clothes felt like a million pounds. Looking at his thick sweater, it isn't a surprise at all. TJ's quieted down next to me. His eyes are open, staring up at the sky as he chuffs quietly. They're so wide and glassy I can see the reflection of the stars twinkling in them. I tentatively reach out and rest a paw on his head, like I did with Carl. TJ barely reacts, continuing to stare up at the sky. Tej? I feel Leo's huge presence crouch down next to me as he gets close and whispers into my ear. Listen, we should get going to my house. I don't like being out here, especially if that thing really did do it. But TJ, I don't know if he's able. I'll carry him. And he does, scooping the links up into his arms like he's a baby. Alright, come on. We can rest at my house. Let's just get the fuck out of here. Leo starts trekking up the rocky slope. Kudzu and I wait for Carl, who lays on the ground a moment longer, before finally rolling over and getting laboriously to his feet. I hold one hand, and Kudzu holds the other, and together we make our way onto the road and back into Echo. The walk to Leo's house is short, only about 15 minutes, but it feels like it takes much, much longer than that. Every tiny sound makes me jump, and I'm stealing myself for the moment when I see that creature again. Nothing happens, though. No screaming and no gunshots. Aside from the crickets, the town is dead quiet. Still, we keep to the shadows, cutting through some backyards and sagebrush, probably picking up dozens of spiders and ticks along the way. It's funny, despite everything that's going on, spiders are the biggest thing that are on my mind as I push through the branches and foliage. Finally, the wolf's small house appears out of the dusty, dark night. Leo walks ahead of us with TJ. TJ has to walk on his own halfway here, and now he's clinging to Leo's hand like a kid afraid of getting lost at the mall. I don't blame him. As we're walking up to the house, though, Leo stops. Kudzu, Carl, and I crowd behind him. What is it? 
Leo puts a finger to his lips, then points at the window on the side of his house. It's broken. Shit. Leo lets go of TJ's hand, then makes a stay here motion with the other as he starts creeping toward the house. With some difficulty and a few awkward sounds, Leo pulls his gun out of his wet pants. I scream internally at the thought of Leo going in alone, but he is the only w one with a weapon now. Apparently Kudzu had lost his during the whole lake incident, which Leo is pretty pissed about. Leo tries the door, then disappears inside, reaching out to make sure the screen door doesn't bang shut behind him. And then he was gone. We stand there in the silence a moment, then Kudzu whispers, Hey, let's stand back to back just in case. Yeah, okay. Kudzu turns toward the road while I face toward Leo's house. Carl and TJ stand on either side of us. TJ hasn't said a word since Leo put him down. Ever since what happened at the lake, something in him snapped. Maybe we should have just gone up to my place. Carl gazes up sadly toward the mountains, his mansion somewhere hidden in the darkness. I don't know. If someone broke into Leo's place to steal stuff, they'd definitely want to do the same to yours. Knowing this town, Kudzu is probably right. Most of the people here resented Carl's family and the way their mansion looked over the whole town. Like they're taunting us, people would say. I keep my eyes on the house, trying to see through the black windows. Leo hasn't turned any of the lights on, of course, so I can't really see anything. Listening doesn't bring any clues either. So, uh, what do you guys think that thing was? I don't know. I still think it was a kind of animal. It practically bent the car in half. I say it out the side of my mouth, away from TJ. Maybe we should go inside? Probably safer in there, even if there is a burglar or whatever. Didn't the mayor say something about it? Like that it only kills us if we're trying to leave? I glance back at Kudzu. Is that what she was talking about? Kudzu shakes his head and shrugs his shoulders. I really don't know, Chase. So we go back to waiting. I'm about to mention that maybe we should move closer to the house, just in case, when we hear a scream. It comes from inside Leo's house, and it definitely doesn't sound like Leo. Carl squeaks next to me. Shit! I'm already running up the stairs, though, and I hear the others following closely behind. I push through the, through the door, almost running headlong into the bench where you're supposed to take off your shoes. Leo? I shout just as I realize that it's probably a bad idea. A moment passes where the only sound I can hear is the heavy breathing of my friends behind me. Then, down here, turn on the lights. His voice comes from the hallway, and it's calm. I move a paw along the wall before, before finding the light switch, revealing the kitchen. We move down the hallway toward Leo's room where I can see that the light is on. Inside, I find Leo standing over his own bed. In the bed, I see someone else. A little pole cat, disheveled in a tank top, looking even more skeletal than usual. It's Clint, curled up in a little ball, cowering. Leo has his gun pointed on him. Wait, please, please don't shoot me. I, I just needed a place to stay. Leo inches the gun lower. Then why aren't you at your own place? Kudzu and Carl stand next to me while TJ sta stays in the doorway, gazing in at us from the dim hallway. Leo raises his gun again, and I actually think he's about to shoot Clint. Clint raises his paws, whining. Leo, wait! He, he helped me find Chase. What? Leo glances at Kudzu, then back at Clint. He, uh... uh he came up to my trailer last night, told me he saw Chase in the trailer. I'm confused too, but I guess I never asked Kudzu how exactly he was able to find me. My mind immediately flashes back to when I saw Clint peering in at me in the trailer, asking Brian for drugs. I might not have found Chase if he hadn't told me. Clint nods enthusiastically to that, but Leo doesn't lower the gun. Wait, Leo! Clint hasn't done anything to hurt us since this started, just... Everyone's gone fucking crazy. Might as well get rid of him before he gets a chance at it too. What? What are you doing, Leo? Leo's got a hardened look on his face that I don't recognize at all. Wait, wait, I, I know how to get out of here, I think. Leo's stance falters, but only just. What do you mean? That's, that's why I'm here. Just get the gun off me for a second, I'll explain. 
Clint is twitchy and keeps scratching at his chest and arms. It comes off like he was able to find those drugs after all. Come on, Leo. It's all of us against him. He can't do anything to us. Leo keeps the gun up for a few seconds, then finally lowers it with a dismissive grunt. Alright, fine. How are we supposed to get out of here? Clint slowly pushes himself up to sit against the frame of Leo's bed, clearing his throat. Well, uh, I think it might have something to do with the train yard. There's a moment of silence as we all wait for Clint to go on. He just stares back at us, though. Well, stares at the gun in Leo's paws. Clint? Huh? Clint doesn't look at Kudzu as his eyes remain fixated on the pistol. Leo, just put the gun down for a second, okay? I'll address it behind you or something. Leo shakes his head. I'm not risking our lives again, Kud. Leo fixes Glint Clint with a glare. The most I'm going to do is keep the gun off you, Clint. Clint flinches when Leo says his name. I look over and see Carl twisting his paws around in the pocket of his hoodie, his eyes wide. TJ, on the other hand, is still standing in the hall, his eyes glinting softly in the dim lighting. For some reason, I get the feeling that he's looking at me. Tell. Us. Now. Leo's tone turns dark and I look over, half expecting him to have the gun up again. Excuse me one moment. It's still pointed at the carpet, but I can practically see Leo's fingers twitching against the trigger guard. He looks almost excited. The Leo I know would never be so eager to kill someone. Even if that someone happens to be Clint. I hope that when this is over, if we get out of this somehow, Leo is able to get back to that old self. The... The... I... Clint's shaking so bad that he can barely speak. Finally, Kudzu steps in between them. Alright, Leo. If you want to keep the gun, that's fine. But can you at least step into the hallway? Maybe he'll be able to calm down enough. No! Kudzu stops short, but I see him set his jaw, drawing up his shoulders. Someone actually might have some information to get us out of here, and all you want to do is scare him shitless? I can see Leo puffing himself up too, and I don't like the look in his eyes. So I step forward on Kudzu's right, practically blocking Clint from Leo's line of sight. When I do, Leo's eyes snap to mine, the simmering snarl disappearing from his muzzle. Leo, come on. Otter, move out of the way. His tone is gentle, like I'm some kind of kid. No, Leo, you're acting weird right now. Just calm down for a sec, okay? Leo frowns at me. Hey. I'm just trying to keep all of us safe. I see the wolf leaning his head to the side a little, like he's trying to keep an eye on Clint. Leo, let's go out into the hall. Kudzu, I give the raccoon a sidelong glance. You can handle him for a few minutes, okay? Kudzu nods. I take a few cautious steps toward Leo. He's looking between me and Kudzu now, and there's a different look on his face. One that I'm having trouble placing. I reach out and gently touch his arm. The muscles are hard, his biceps standing out thickly under his fur. Still, I gently try to push him towards the door. As I do, I feel him go a little slack, and with a whole lot of relief on my part, he finally starts moving toward the hallway. Carl, still gaping at the whole scene, suddenly seems to snap out of it and hurriedly moves out of our way, into the hall. Leo reluctantly continues to shuffle down the hallway as I put an arm around his side hugging him to me. He responds with the same gesture. We pass a solemn looking TJ, his eyes following me as we move toward the kitchen. You okay, TJ? He doesn't say anything, instead just slowly following us into the kitchen. His fur is still all spiky and mussed up from the plunge into the lake, and his clothes look uncomfortably damp. That gives me an idea. Why don't we all get our clothes into the dryer? Then maybe we can have something to eat? There's a moment of silence, neither TJ nor Leo giving me any response. Carl gives a muffled cough, though. Uh, actually, I could go for some food. Excuse me? About 20 minutes later, TJ...
Carl, TJ, and I are sitting in the laundry room, putting our clothes through a dryer. I can hear Leo in the kitchen, frying something up on the stove. While I should be worried about not keeping an eye on him, he's calmed down considerably since we were in his bedroom. Also, the laundry room is between the kitchen and the bedroom, so it would be pretty hard for him to get past without me seeing. So I keep watch, leaning against the wall, staring out into the dark hallway. Carl sits on the dryer, vibrating along with it while TJ sits on the floor, cross-legged, looking at nothing. This feels so good on my ass, dude. What, the vibration? Uh, no, the heat. That was freezing and I didn't even realize it. Carl knocks his hooves against the side of the metal dryer. Hey, Tej, you wanna join me up here? No, thank you. You could just lean up against the side. You gotta be cold, too. This time, TJ doesn't say anything, and I finally look away from the hallway. TJ, are you okay? Do you want to talk? TJ looks up at me, again with those emotionless eyes. No. He says it so quietly, it's almost like he didn't say anything at all. I hold his gaze for a while before looking away. Aw, oh, don't worry about it, Tej. We're gonna be out of here in no time. Carl slides off the dryer, his damp underwear squeaking loudly against the metal as he clops to the ground. He gives a few strategic tugs at his underwear to probably loosen the wedge he just created. Then he sits down on the ground in front of TJ, cross-legged as well. TJ barely looks up at him and I notice the links trembling slightly. Listen, back at my house, I was like, stuck in this weird trap version of my house. Like there was no exit. TJ finally glances up at the ram. And, well, I thought I was going to be stuck forever, and I was panicking. It was, a night it was like a nightmare that wouldn't end. But then, right when I was giving up, you guys woke me up. I mean, sure, I sort of woke up into another nightmare, but at least it's with you guys, right? I hear shifting. Then the bedroom door swings open fully and Kudzu appears, slipping out and closing the door quietly behind him. The raccoon spots me and moves over to stand next to me, his ears perked. Hey. Hey. I see Kudzu's nose twitch at the air, looking towards the kitchen. Leo? He's cooking. Ah. So, uh, how'd it go? You were in there for a while. Kudzu sighs and leans against the wall of the hallway, looking back at the closed door. I... don't know, really. Said something about a train going through here the past few days after everything started. Through the rail yard? That's what he says. Huh. That didn't make much sense. That rail yard has been abandoned for the past... at least 50 years. Are you sure he isn't just like... the rest of us? Seeing things? Kudzu shrugs. I really don't know. Hard to tell with a guy like him. Yeah. Well, I remember some guys inspecting the rails a few weeks ago. Maybe they opened one up again? That idea also seems strange to me, but I don't know much about trains. So what? If there is a train going through here, are we just gonna jump onto it? That was his plan, anyway. <laughs> Sounds like fun. My mind jumps to Robert Smith and what exactly happened to him when he tried to hop a train. Even if we were able to get on the train, could that creature thing still get to us? It was able to knock the car into the lake, so I don't know how capable it is. So when does the train come? He's not sure. Said it seemed random. I sigh loudly. Then we all jump as the dryer finishes with a loud grating buzz. I shakily rub my face, then move to open the dryer. Well, let's at least get our clothes back on. Then we can go in the kitchen and tell Leo what's going on. We all sit, the, sit at the table, eating quietly as Kudzu tells Leo everything. The food looks like some kind of vegetable stir-fry. The first bite reminds me that I'm starving, and it's hard not to just try and shove all of it into my mouth at once. Carl, sitting across from me, does just that. That sounds like a load of bullshit. Kudzu shrugs. I don't know what else to go on. Why would he lie, anyway? To buy himself some time? Kudzu closes his eyes for a second, breathing in deeply. 
listen, Leo, there's no way he's going to try anything. He's scared out of his mind right now. Duke was scared. Didn't stop him from trying to kill us. It's probably worse that he's scared. Leo looks up the hallway toward the bedroom. I'm starting to not like the look in his eyes again. In fact, I'm wondering why the fuck we left him in the room alone in the first fucking place. Leo starts to show his teeth. I reach out and rest a paw on the wolf's arm, again feeling the tensing of the muscles underneath the fur. Hey, don't worry about it. But he jerks his arm away and suddenly turns on me. Why the hell are you on his side with this shit? You were with that fucking bear, you know what these crazies are doing. I wince internally at being reminded of the incident, but I try again, reaching out. Yeah, but Clint isn't Brian. You know he was pushed around by that bear too. Leo pulls his arm further away from me. He's looking back and forth between me and Kudzu again. What is this? You're both acting like I'm the crazy one. The wolf pushes his chair back from the table one moment. I heard you whispering shit in the hallway. You been saying things behind my back? Leo narrows his eyes at Kudzu. Whoa, dude, chill out. Why don't you keep eating, Carl? Leo shifts his gaze towards the bedroom again before abruptly standing up. I'm gonna check on him. Leo? I start to stand up as well, but Kudzu is one step ahead of me. He moves to intercept the wolf, both hands out. Come on, Leo. But he doesn't get to finish. Instead, the wolf goes straight into him, grabbing one of his arms and punching at his face. Kudzu sees it coming and is able to duck, but he's not quite fast enough. Leo's knuckles glance off the raccoon's muzzle, knocking his head around. Leo keeps a hold of the arm and swings Kudzu around, away from the hallway and back into the kitchen. Kudzu takes the fall rather well, going into a sort of roll. He does end up banging, banging against Carl's chair, but he comes up on one knee, panting and staring up at Leo. His nose is bleeding. What the fuck?! I'm standing before I know it and moving around the table to stand at Kudzu's side. I look him over, trying to see if Leo had done many serious damage before I look back at the wolf. What are you doing?! Carl clumsily tries to help the raccoon up, his ears flat against his head. Leo breathes heavily, staring down at Kudzu before his eyes flick to me. Get away from him. What? Get. Away from him. This time there's a growly quality to his voice, and I see his fingers drift towards his belt. I do move away from Kudzu, but only just. I don't want either of us getting shot. Leo turns his attention to Kudzu. You! Out! Kudzu stares up at the wolf for only a moment before getting briskly to his feet. His breathing is so erratic I'm wondering if he's going to have a panic attack. He gives me a single glance before hurrying out of the kitchen. I want to stop him, get in his way like he did Leo's. But the look on Leo's face right now has me frozen, and I can't do or say anything as I watch the raccoon's tail disappear. I hear the door swing open, then bang shut. I look back and almost jump as I see Leo's eyes are still on me, studying me. He stares a while longer before turning away and st stomping loudly down the hall. Carl is frozen next to me, and TJ just sits there, his eyes down on his plate, food untouched. Still numb, I have to force myself to walk forward, following Leo, terrified of what's about to happen. Leo, wait. My voice is too quiet too soft for the wolf to even hear me. The door ahead of me swings open. There's a moment of silence, then... Leo curses loudly and I run to the door frame, looking inside, not sure what I'm about to find. What I'm about to find is a drink! What I find is... nothing. No one's inside. The covers of the bed are thrown back, the window wide open. See? See? I told you. Leo's voice goes from an almost scream to a hushed whisper as he moves through the window, looking out into the night. He slides the window shut, then locks it. This is exactly what I was worried about. What? Inside, I'm relieved more than anything. 
For some reason, I'm positive that if Clint was still here, or if Leo had caught him in the act of trying to escape, I don't doubt he would have tried to shoot him. That stupid fucking raccoon, thinking he knew what was best. Leo continues to peer out the window, his ears perked up. I know what the hell's best for us. Thinks he can just come in and tell everyone what to do. See what happens. I start to move back into the hallway, toward the kitchen, but Leo suddenly whirls around on me. His frown turns into a sort of uncertain smile. Hey, Otter, are you okay? I don't say anything, I just stare at him. Otter? Vaguely, I can hear Carl clopping around uncertainly in the hallway, probably too afraid to get close. I try to speak, then wet my lips. Y yeah Leo extends a paw. Come here. Did I scare you? I fidget with my paws. N no Well, come on then. Slowly, I move into the wolf's room. Despite my dragging feet, my mind is racing, trying to decide what the hell is going on. What the hell I'm going to do. Leo's lost it, there's no question about that. It's something that I've sort of known for the past day, ever since we found him in Duke's basement. Now it's getting worse. A lot worse. Still, I continue to move toward him, like I'm in some kind of dream. Soon he's got me wrapped up in his arms, and despite the warmth, despite the strength I feel in them, I don't feel good about it at all. I'm just scared. Chula. He breathes into my ear, sending shivers down my spine. I told you I'm going to protect you. I'm going to keep you safe. That's exactly what I'm going to do. He starts rocking me back and forth, shifting us around on his feet like we're doing some kind of half dance at prom. He's moved us around so that I'm looking over the at, looking at the door, and I can see Carl's horns, his eyes fearfully peering into the room. That raccoon. He wasn't good for you. Good for me? He helped me! Leo gives me a squeeze that almost knocks the breath from my lungs, and that cuts me off. Maybe. Maybe not. I could see him acting strange. Kind of like the others. The wolf continues to rock us back and forth as I continue to look over Leo's shoulders, seeing in Carl's eyes that this is definitely fucked up. I don't say anything else to Leo, worried about how he might take it if I keep trying to convince him that Kudzu was only trying to help us. I'm going to get you all out of here like I should have done from the beginning, okay? He gives me a little shake when I'm silent a little too long. Okay. Okay and he keeps rocking me like that for what seems like hours. And when we make another revolution, I can see that Carl's not there anymore. <laughs> then I hear something. Soft at first, then louder and louder. Leo stops dancing with me. I can make out a rhythmic, dull metallic sound, accompanied by a horn. A train? TJ and Carl are standing at the back door, staring out into the night. Excuse me, one more time. Leo pushes past them, ears perked as he tries to see through the darkness. The train sounds incredibly close, almost like it's only feet away. Should we go to it, like Clint said? Leo pauses, his nose twitching before he waves his paw at us. You guys stay here, I'm gonna have a look. Leo! And just like that, the wolf disappears into the night, leaving us behind. I stare out into the night. So, guess Clint wasn't shooting us after all, huh? Yeah. All I can think about right now, though, is Kudzu. Did he hear the train right now? Was he on his way over there? I look to my right, toward Kudzu's house, only a few hundred feet away. Quietly, I start stepping outside. Chase? Carl's voice behind me is timid, scared. I look back at him able to make out the whites of his eyes in the darkness. TJ lurks behind him, staring at me as well, though far more stoically. I'll be right back. I just need to check on Kudzu. Everything that Kudzu had done for me up to this point, 
saving me multiple times, making sure I was doing okay, nursing me back to health. Hell, even helping me with my project before all the shit went down. I'm not going to abandon him. Just like with Leo when he was imprisoned by Duke, I feel like it's my responsibility. Only this time, the urge is even stronger. I have to make sure Kudzu makes it out of here like the rest of us. Carl, though, doesn't seem so enthusiastic about that. I don't know if that's such a good idea. You saw Leo. Carl looks over my shoulder, and I do the same, worried that maybe the wolf was coming back. But all I see is darkness. I realize then that Carl is just as afraid of the wolf as I am right now. I swear, I'm only going to be away for a few minutes. If Leo asks, tell him I... I don't know, just tell him he needed some air. That won't... I don't wait for Carl to finish his sentence. My eyes slowly adjust, but it's too dark to really see any more than five feet. The amount of stars overhead is almost dazzling, but it's not enough light to help me see. In fact, it's almost disorienting. The way the bright, powder look of the sky clashes with the black horizon of the mountains. Focusing on it too much makes my stomach turn, and I turn my eyes down, trying to focus on the barely visible ground instead. Until my face slams right into something big, hard, and full of twigs. Jesus fucking goddamn it! I shout whisper into my paws, covering my nose, afraid for a second that maybe I ran one of my eyes through. A quick but shaky examination with my fingers puts that fear at ease, though now I feel like my muzzle has gone flat into my face. That jolt had me feeling all the aches of my past two incidents with cars. I stand there in the dark for a moment, gathering my senses. It's almost completely silent now. The train, if it was a train, has passed us by at this point. The metallic clanks and rushing sound is far behind me. Standing in the silence, though, is starting to give me second thoughts. I'm pretty sure there aren't any trees between Leo and Kudzu's house. Did I get off track somehow? Something cracks a little ways ahead of me and I freeze up, my ears twitching. I listen hard, trying to hear anything above the crickets. Okay, yeah, this was really fucking stupid. I remember that I'm not all that far away from Leo's house, and look back at the yellow squares of windows in the distance. I should probably go back to reorient myself and try to get to Kudzu's house again. As I'm turning around, though, another crack behind me, followed by a muffled voice. Shit. I freeze at the voice. I open my mouth to try and quietly call out, but stop myself. I can't be sure, but it sounded like Kudzu, albeit muffled and low-pitched. I decide to wait a while longer, with one foot pointed out towards Leo's house. Then... This time the sound is right next to me and I jump in the air. I make a run for the house, and immediately trip over several rocks going face first into the ground. I'm scrambling at the ground with my paws and feet when I hear the voice again. Whoa, whoa. Chase? I slump back to the ground in relief. Oh my god, Kudzu! What the hell are you doing? I feel the raccoon's paws feel over me, then pull me back up to my feet. I heard a train, then I saw someone. Are you okay? From the faint light of the stars, I can make out Kudzu's ears and the tip of his muzzle. My eyes have adjusted to the point where I can even see the mask in his fur. Yeah, I wanted to come get you, in case we were going to try to hop the train. I look over my shoulder, trying to listen for the train again. A little late for that, eh? Well, yeah, but I didn't want to leave you behind. Ah. I rub my face where I hit the branch. Listen, I don't know what's going on with Leo, but maybe we can go back and try to talk. Kudzu shakes his head. Nah, he's... I don't think he's gonna listen. As much as I hate to admit it, Kudzu is probably right. Well, I'm not gonna leave you out here after everything we went through. I see a glint of white teeth as Kudzu gives me a small smile. Wow. Well, thanks, man. But really, you should probably get back before he... At that moment, I realized something. Wait, what were you doing out here? You said you saw someone? Kudzu shifts slightly, from one foot to the other. I thought I did, at least. Like someone from the town, or... I think it was your friend. What? The, uh, the fox. Jenna? Jenna? 
My eyes go wide and I turn back to the darkness, squinting. Where? Where did you see her? Uh... Kudzu turns to look with me, then takes a few steps forward. Well, I was going back to my trailer after the whole thing with Leo. Then this fox girl just kind of jumped out from the side of my house. Where did she go? My heart's hammering in my chest right now as I strain to see her. Jenna's been on my mind since the very beginning, and her absence has only become more prominent after finding the others. Well, I think she went off in that direction. Kudzu points into the darkness. I could hear her running off, but then the footsteps stopped, so I think she might have stopped and hid somewhere. Come on, then. I motioned Kudzu forward and stepped toward the blackness of the wilderness. Hold on, I was going to grab a flashlight. There's no way we're finding anything out there at this time of night. You go get them. I'll wait. Of course, I'm terrified of being left alone, but I'm also terrified of Jenna running away if I don't keep watch. Excuse me. Reading lots of text is thirsty work, don't you know? I'm getting the feeling she might be under the same influence that Carl or TJ had been earlier. You sure? Yeah, I want to stay here in case she comes out. I wave him away. Okay, but yell if something happens, alright? Okay. Kutsu goes in and comes out within less than a minute, though it feels way longer than that. While he was gone, I risked a few loud whispers of Jenna's name but I didn't get any response. Pretty soon, a beam of light is sweeping the dirt, sagebrush, and cacti as we slowly make our way in the direction that Jenna had run. Apparently, it was through the backyard and out toward the desert. I'm worried that maybe she didn't stop running. Why was she running? Did she say anything? I whisper softly to Kudzu as I follow along with him, one hand on his shoulder. No, just looked up at me and took off. Looked terrified of something. I frown, my paw tightening a bit on the raccoon's shoulder. Maybe it's just because she doesn't know you, right? Maybe she was heading to Leo's place. Maybe. I try to focus on the sea of pale glow in front of me, the bright, cold light of the flashlight sucking the color out of the desert. The grays and whites all sort of blend together after a while, and the swinging motion of the beam starts to lull me into a weird hypnotic state. It's at this moment that I catch movement out of the corner of my eye, on the right, where the light isn't currently pointed. I hear the sound of shifting dirt and gravel, immediately followed by a bizarre, high-pitched snarl that makes me gasp in horror. I actually even piss myself a little as I see a glint of white teeth. Kudzu tries to swing the beam back in the direction of the sound, and at the same time, I try to pull him back with the paw on his shoulder. Whatever it is hits Kudzu hard, knocking him back and sending me tumbling away to land on my ass. The flashlight rolls away from the raccoon's paw and shines into my face, briefly blinding me. I can sense a loud, growling commotion right in front of me, along with the sound of Kudzu grunting. Numbly, I reach out and snatch up the flashlight then turn on the sounds. First I see Jenna, her ears back, teeth bared, swinging her paws at a crumpled heap on the ground. That heap is Kudzu, and he's got his arms up in self-defense, snarling back, his eyes wide. Jenna! Just like that, the snarl drops from her face and her eyes snap up to mine. Chase? But then the position is suddenly reversed as Kudzu grabs the fox by the wrist and practically barrel rolls. Now Kudzu sits on her back as, she, as he keeps a hold on her wrist. Wait! Stop! I rush over to them, grabbing Kudzu's upper arm, trying to pull his paw away from Jenna. It's okay! She's good! She recognizes me! Kudzu only hesitates for a moment before scrambling off the fox and backing away, breathing hard. Jenna quickly sits up, absentmindedly brushing off her shirt as she looks up at me. Oh my god, Chase! She says it in a hushed whisper, putting a paw to her mouth. Jenna! Are you okay? I reach down to help her up, and she immediately goes in to hug me. I stand there awkwardly for a moment as she buries her face into my shoulder, gasping for breath. I'm not sure if she's crying or not. 
Are you okay? I ask again, patting her back awkwardly. Sorry, sorry. I'm fine. Jenna steps back and wipes under her eye with the bag of her paw. I just... I didn't know where any of you were. Where were you? Jenna looks alright for the most part, except for a bunch of dirt on her clothes and in her fur. But then, I don't know if that's from before or after she was wrestling with Kudzu. I... it's... I don't know, I was out in the desert and... It's still dark, obviously, but I can make out the frown on her face as she seems to struggle for words. Finally, Kudzu steps in. Hey, let's get to my trailer. We can talk it out in there, alright? Jenna silently nods, then seems to really focus on Kudzu. Wait, who are you? I step in for the raccoon. This is Kudzu, he's a friend. He saved me a bunch of times. That seems to be good enough for Jenna. With that out of the way, we all head back toward the trailer. Quietly, Kudzu lets us into his trailer, opening the screen door slowly so that it, so that it doesn't creak. He motions us inside and Jenna follows in behind me, pressing close. I suppose she has good reason to be wary of the place. She doesn't really know Kudzu, and at this point it's hard to even trust people that you do know. Kudzu closes the door and slides the locks in place. Jenna stands next to me in the small living room area, arms fold folded tightly against her body like she's hugging herself. Hey, you want to sit down? I gesture at the recliner, which Jenna stares at for a few seconds. Um, I don't know. The fox's ears are twitching around and pointed straight up. I turn to the small love seat set against the wall instead. Maybe there? I can sit with you. After a few more moments of staring at the couch, Jenna finally nods. She walks stiffly over to the couch, looking at it for a moment before finally sitting down. I notice three clumped up patches of fur on the back of her neck, and it takes me a moment to realize that it's dried blood. Had someone attacked her? Had she hurt herself? Jenna still doesn't relax when we're settled and is instead sat bolt upright, leaning hard against my shoulder. Much like her ears, her eyes are darting around, mostly over to the curtain window to our right. Meanwhile, Kudzu elects to sit in the empty recliner after turning it a little to face us. The scraping sound it makes on the floor causes Jenna to jump. Kudzu pauses, blinking, then settles back in the recliner. Sorry, I really should put a rug under this thing. <laughs> Jenna doesn't say anything, and instead just looks back at the window. Kudzu shifts awkwardly in the chair, then looks at me. I look at Jenna, trying to think of something to say. Jenna beats me to it. Do you know where the others are? TJ or Carl? Oh yeah! Yeah, they're at Leo's place. Them and Leo. Jenna frowns at me. Then why are we here? Let's go. She starts to stand up, but I reach out a paw, grabbing her arm. She flinches and yanks away from me, standing up fully. Sorry, just hold on a second. We... <sighs> it's complicated. Why? Jenna takes a step back from me, folding her arms. The look in her eyes is worrying, like she's starting to not trust me. Look, Leo, he's kind of uptight right now. I guess I just wanted to give him some space. Give myself some space, really away from him. Kudzu shifts in his chair again. He kicked me out. Things got a little heated between us. Jenna looks at Kudzu, the deep frown still on her face. Why? Leo wouldn't do that without a reason. She looks back at me, as if wanting some sort of confirmation. I nod. Leo isn't really himself right now. I'm really worried about him. Can we go over there and talk to him? I open my mouth, but I pause, trying to think of the right way to say it. I... I don't know. Not right now. I'm not leaving Kudzu, so I'm gonna have to think of a way to get Leo to calm down. I'm also considering just staying separate from him until we can get out of here, but I don't want to tell Jenna that. She looks stressed out enough as it is. Now that I think about it, I wouldn't be surprised if Leo was out there, hunting for me right now. 
Odds are that he's going to come here eventually. Maybe. Maybe he jumped the train already. That reminds me, though. Oh, yeah! We think we found a way out! Really? Yeah. Apparently a train goes through here once in a while. We're thinking we can hitch a ride on it. Jenna takes that in, then just nods. The silence drags out for a minute or two before I finally lean towards her again. It's okay. Just calm down and relax for a minute. She does so with even more hesitance than the first time, sitting on the couch cushion like it might be a landmine. So, uh, where were you these past few days? If you want to tell me, I mean. Jenna stares at the floor, then shrugs. I don't really know. It's kind of a blur. I nod. Yeah, same. I guess it happened two, three days ago? I don't remember, but everything was normal until TJ woke up. It was like he was in a trance or something. I wasn't sure what was wrong with him. I thought he might have been having a seizure. Then I thought he was in a psychosis of some kind. He left the motel and just started running, so I followed him. He ran all the way to the lake, and I was sure he was going to get, go in. But then he just stopped on the shore and stared at it. I caught up to him and tried to talk to him, but it was like I wasn't there. All he could say was your name, Chase. Chase, where's Chase? I thought he was looking in the water for you. Jenna looks right at me. I don't know why. Do you? Of course not. I shake my head. I have no idea. Liar. The couch tilts. And so I sort of grabbed his shoulder to lead him back, away from the lake. But then he turned on me, and he sort of just... changed. The water changed that day. My head spins and I brace my paws against the armrest, trying not to fall over. And he attacked me. Clawed me up. And for the first time... Jenna sticks out her arm and pulls back some of the fur where I see bits of crusted blood. You knew what water felt like. I had to run from him, and he chased me for a while. To everyone else. And as I did, I realized the whole town was different. Everyone was different. Suffocating. I swallow hard, still ripping into the couch. But Jenna doesn't seem to notice, and Kudz is looking at her. The humming in my head finally starts to die down. You say he's at Leo's. Is he okay? Did he explain what happened? I shake my head, but only a little. I feel like I'm going to throw up. No, but he has been acting a little strange, I guess. I, I need to talk to him, make sure he's actually okay. We will. Though I'm not sure that she'll find him okay at all. So what happened after all that? It looked like you were hiding out there. Kudzu gestures a paw at the window. Jenna covers her face with both paws, sighing deeply. That I'm not too sure about. After I ran, it all just sort of became a dream. I only remember bits and pieces. We wait a moment as Jenna seems to think. I remember I went back to the motel, I think. But then I saw something. Jenna pauses, then lets out a little humorless laugh. A thing that I remember from my childhood. A monster, I guess. A monster? Yeah, like this... thing. Jenna waves her paw in front of her face. It had like a red face and... I don't know, I thought I saw it on my closet a few times as a kid. It felt like it was chasing me. What do you think it was? Jenna laughs hollowly again. <laughs> Oh, I don't think it's anything. I must have had my own little breakdown after seeing everyone else's. Jenna sighs deeply again, sitting back on the couch. But then you guys came along and now I think everything is clear. Jenna leans back for a moment, breathing deeply, and for the first time it seems like she's relaxing a bit. She turns her attention back to Kudzu. Hey, Kudzu is it? Kudzu nods. Mind if I use your restroom? I just need a moment to collect myself. And pee, too. An actual toilet would be nice. Oh, yeah, just right there. 
Kudzu points at a thin little white door between the kitchen and the living area. Thanks. And with that, Jenna disappears into the bathroom. Kudzu and I sit in silence for a moment, listening to the sound of running water from the faucet. Well, I think now we have a reason to go back to Leo's house. I know he won't be mad at you if he knows you found Jenna. I don't know about that, but yes, we're going to have to go back with her. I'll talk to him first, in case he's still... out of it. Again, thanks. I am glad you're here with me right now. Kudzu rubs his arm awkwardly. I get... panicky when things get physical, which they have a lot lately. I gesture at the cushion next to me, and after a moment of hesitation, Kudzu gets up from the recliner to sit next to me. I reach around him and squeeze him to my side. It's cool. Like I said, you saved my ass so many times at this point, it's the least I can do. I almost tell him that he's been there for me more than anyone at this point, but that feels like a bit too much right now. Kudzu chuckles and leans back, his arm brushing mine. I didn't always used to be like this, you know. What? A fucking coward. I scrunch my muzzle up. What? No way! You've been insanely brave! Kudzu shakes his head. Nah. You saw me at Duke's house when you got caught, and then down in the basement. Then when Leo tossed me out. Those are all great reasons to have been scared, Kudzu. You still faced all of it. Kudzu looks unconvinced. I don't know, Chase. After what Leo did, I don't think I was going to come back. I shrug. Well, then I'm glad I came after you then. Kudzu's quiet for a moment. Then he chuckles quietly, leaning his head back to stare at the ceiling. What? Just... I moved to Echo to get away from stuff like this. Kudzu shakes his head. Now look at what's happened. It's fucking ridiculous. Like, people going crazy? That and guns and violence. Peyton isn't a rough city compared to others in this country, but it has rough patches. And I lived in one of those patches. I think you told me that you moved here because there's less people. Kudzu sighs quietly. It's not the only reason. I, um... I lost someone a few years back. I needed a fresh start, I guess. The silence drags out for a moment as I contemplate that. My eyes drift to the picture frames by the love seat, to the one where someone had their arm wrapped around Kudzu. In it, I see a hare, smiling just as toothily as the raccoon next to him, a good head taller than his companion. But now look where I am. <laughs> I snap my eyes back up to the raccoon, not wanting to be caught looking. I don't know what to say, so I just settle with, We're gonna get out. Just gotta listen for that train. Mm-hmm. Kudzu has his eyes closed, so I lean back too. Despite all the shit going on outside, there's something really peaceful about being here, next to Kudzu in his neat little trailer. We sit there a while, listening to the soft rush of running water. After a while, I look toward the bathroom, realizing how uncomfortably full my bladder is right now. Jenna doesn't seem to be coming out anytime soon, though. Listen, I gotta take a piss. Again? Kudzu smirks at me. Well, yeah, it's been a few hours. I pee a lot anyway. Oh yeah? Very good to know. Yeah. <laughs> I'll be right back. Kudzu's joking demeanor suddenly drops. I don't know, I think we should stick together right now. Remember what happened last time? Do you want to watch me? Kudzu pauses. I'll stand at the doorway, all right? Just go by the side of the trailer. All right, all right. I head back outside while Kudzu hangs back by the door. Just make it quick, and again, yell if something happens. It's fine, I'll only be a few feet away. I had a small smile at how motherly Kudzu's being right now. After everything that's happened, it's no wonder. I move around the side of the trailer, back into the darkness. Quickly, I unbutton and zip down my fly. I start to go when I hear some footsteps behind me. I look over my shoulder. Kudzu? What? And then two massive paws wrap around my body. I look down and get a glimpse of thick claws and brown matted fur. I scream as I'm pulled back into the dark toward the desert. 
I know who it is immediately. The smell is unmistakable. That and the high-pitched voice cursing as he drags me along through the brush. Chase! Kudzu's scream seems like it's only a few yards away. He's going to catch up to us and then... I don't know what. Try to fight Brian off, I guess. But just as I'm thinking that, Brian picks me up off the ground and practically throws me. The next thing I know, my head is throbbing as the back of it knocks against something hard. My legs are all splayed upwards, my foot pads pressed against something that's smooth and cool. I hear more cursing and the sound of snarling. Kudzu? Then I hear the sound of a car door slam and I realize I'm in a truck, my feet pressed against a windshield. Brian's massive bulk squeezes in next to me and I feel the truck accelerate. The backside wobbles back and forth in the sand as it tries to find purchase in the ground. But then we find the road and I'm pressed back in the seat as Brian steps hard on the gas. We will leave off there and conclude Leo's route finally next time. Until then, thanks for watching everybody. Bye!